just want to explain to everyone what we're seeing here. We've talked a lot out here at Thacker Pass, Behemaha, that the sagebrush are the keystone species. A lot of the other life forms depend on the sagebrush for shade, for food, for seed germination, for uh, shelter from winter storms. And I just stumbled across this right here. I don't know how well you can see that there. You may have to splice it in. But what I'm looking at right here is ants all over the sagebrush. Now, at first I thought the ants were eating the sagebrush, but that's not what we're seeing. Instead, there are tiny little aphids all over the leaves of this sagebrush. Those aphids are eating the sagebrush, and the ants are farming the aphids. I've heard of this before and I've seen it on other plants. Ants will essentially keep these aphids almost as we would keep chickens. They protect them from predators. They m even move them around to different locations. Sometimes they bite off the wings of the aphids so they can't fly away. Sometimes not. And I don't know if that's the case here that the ants don't actually eat the aphids, they milk them. They stroke the aphids in a certain way and the aphids exude this nectar, this sweet, sugary substance, and the ants eat that. This isn't gonna hurt the sagebrush plant too much. This bush is probably 100, 150 years old, maybe more. It's about seven, eight feet tall. It's healthy, it's lush, it's vibrant. It's not worried about a few aphids on some of its leaves. And so here we have these three species working together. They all survive, they all thrive in this harsh place. You know, that's the lessons of ecology. That's just the lessons that we can learn from paying attention to the natural world and the other beings around us. How to live in ways that don't destroy the world, but instead enrich the world. And we see that right here with this sage bush and the ants and the aphids all living together. This probably wouldn't last if the mine goes in. The open pit would come up much of this area it might even come up to here and this whole area over here would be full of toxic tailings but where now we have this sacred stillness and quiet and this dance between these different species we would have pollution smoke 24-hour lights razor wire fencing That's the difference between a relationship-based way of life and an extractive or colonial way of life. That's the difference between sustainability and extermination. That's what we need to learn. People know how to live in that way. Spent most of the day hanging out at camp down here with a couple of elders um, two of the grandmothers of the family who we've been spending a lot of time with up here. And they were telling us all the old stories and laughing, sitting around the fire, eating some food together. And You know how it is. We don't need money. We need water. We don't need electric cars. We need habitat. We need places to live and land. So 
The land provides everything we need. And industrial civilization just provides destruction, poison, cancer, toxins, television. So there may be a lot of people who are addicted to that world. There may be a lot of people who think that it is essential that we must continue that way of life. But they're simply wrong. They're addicted, and just like other forms of addiction, they're addicted to something that's hurting them. They're addicted to something that eventually will kill them if they don't stop. And it will kill most of the life on this planet. So, in some ways, you know, those of us who are doing this work, we're trying to break that stranglehold of addiction. We're trying to deny that addictive substance to those people who are just craving it and they can't stop. They're gonna keep destroying because they're addicts. They're not in control. They're not in charge anymore. The substance itself is in control. The substance itself is in charge. The person, the individual is subordinated to it. And it's the same when it comes to these technologies. Here's a sunset to close out this video.